Yes, hello. Um, I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in Toronto. I was at the airport actually three years ago just to check. I wait for a plane to, to New York. Yeah, my warmest regards also, also from Patricia Moroso. She was here last year and we talked on the phone uh, three days ago and she told me it will be very cold, but now it's actually sunshine and not that cold like last year. There was like minus 20 degrees. And yeah, I want to show you my, my latest products, my most popular products, the way how we work, how we get in contact with the companies. Uh, I want to talk about my approach, the, my philosophy, and yeah, the materials I prefer. Okay, so I, I'm born 81 in a small village with 700 people in Germany. And then for, for studying industrial design, I moved to Offenbach, which is a city close to, to Frankfurt in Germany. And I studied there industrial design from 2001 to 2007. And directly, thank you, after my uh, diploma, uh, diploma, I'd established my own studio. So it was always my aim to work for my own. And I started act in actually in my flat in a corner and the corner got bigger and the flat was act at the end of the studio. And uh, one and a half year ago, we moved to a separate space. So now I finally have my privacy again in my flat and the studio, which makes it more comfortable. So here's an insight in the new studio. So we are working here in a team of four or five people with assistants and interns. We have a small workshop at the back because it's very important for us to do small mock-ups, models. It's not necessary to do them in the real material, so because we can't blow the glass in the studio, but just to see it roughly the shape, the silhouette, to check some uh, proportion sizes. So you see one of my most popular products, a bell table already. This one is one I did 2008, nine by myself. So it's one I did, which was presented then in, in Milan at the fair. So this is in the studio. And here you see a big shelf with a lot of inspiration, like souvenirs I bought on my vacations in, in Asia or Africa, also here in North America. There are also prototypes, like for Rosenthal here on the left. And I will, go, I will tell you about all these projects during the next hour. So another picture. So it's very important for us to do the prototypes to see um, how it works directly with the, yeah, when you use them. So the first product actually was one I did for a Dutch brand called Deform. And they asked me to do a very simple um, yeah, chair, like a kitchen chair made of wood. And I really like to work with authentic real materials, so like wood and glass and metal, and, but also to combine them with new technologies. So in this chair, and you will see it later also in a movie about the production, you see craftsmanship, so very traditional techniques, but also new technologies like CNC milling. And I will tell you now in the, in the movie more about the process and the details. So it's a small manufacturer in the Netherlands who's producing these chairs. So here it starts with the back legs. Uh, it's steam bending. It's a very traditional technique, you know, from the famous toner chairs, which are from Germany, you know, from coffee houses in Vienna. And so they have a wooden stick, mostly it's oak. Uh, they put it in the steam oven. Um, completely watered so they get the structure of the wood gets flexible and you can bend them afterwards. And this you see here in the next steps. So it takes out some of the legs he can use for the moment, put them in the press, and then he press them in the right angle for the, for the backrest. And this is a very traditional way to, to produce chairs. And in the past, actually most, like, se actually 70% of the chairs came from this kind of manufacturers, actually from the area of Italy, Udine, where Moroso is also based. Nowadays, more and more chairs are produced in, 
yeah, in Asia or East Europe. So this is actually the last one in the Netherlands who can do chairs with steam bending like this. So now the, the legs are bended and now they have to be on this special machine to try for several days. And on the other hand, the frame is CNC milled because it's not possible to do it that precise by hand. So it's a combination of both. And my idea is to use always the best technology for, for each item in a design, which is the, the easiest way to get the, the approach I want to have. So you see it's a lot of uh, handwork, and this makes it very interesting for me at the beginning of a product to go to these people to understand the material, to, to understand their, their techniques and specialities, to, to see, because I, I, can't, I don't know everything, so it's very important to go to these people to understand the material and how to get to my uh, yeah, conceptual idea, to my approach of my of my design so it's always a collaboration with all the brands i work with so for me it's very interesting to be able to visit the companies that's why nearly most of my products are produced in in europe And now the special idea of this chair is that the backrest is, is a little bit flexible, so it's like it can move like three degrees. And that's that for we used a dip molded element like you have seen now, which is at the backrest on the top. And to this element, the backrest is, is fixed. And this guarantees uh, a flexible movement for some degrees. So the backrest is a bit flexible, not that yeah, straight. Okay. Yeah, these are the first sketches actually of the of the bell table now for Classicon since 2012. Classicon, a brand from Munich, produced the bell table. The design is a bit older. It's from 2008-9. I was invited uh, by Marva Griffin to exhibit at Salone Satellite in Milan during the furniture show, and I I got the yeah the possibility to show there and then I had three months time to exhibit there and I had the idea to do uh, a chair, a, a lamp and a, and a side table. And the starting point was a brass handle I found in London when I used to live there 11 years ago next to a bus stop. There was a very classic casted brass handle and I was very interested in the material, in the process. And on the other hand in glass blowing and brass at that time was not very avant-garde in, in, the, in the furniture design, it was kind of old-fashioned. And I was looking for a company who is doing metal spinning, so it's metal press like lampshades or cooking pots, the top part and the, the base is glass blown. And then I did simple models like here to s check the proportion and then I sent um, the files to a glass blowing company in Bavaria. They still produce it, so they did the first prototype, and till today they produce the, the table. This is uh, at Classicon. When Classicon saw the prototype in a magazine, they asked me if they can produce it, and we developed the second size, several colors, and finishing. You can see them at the booth of Avenue Road. 
And so we did these two sizes of the table, and the glass is done in a company called Freiherr von Poshing in Bavaria. It's close to Czech border, from uh, established or founded 1568. And this is the oldest glass company in the world, which is still in the same family. It's in the 14th generation. And they normally they do uh, yeah, smaller things, uh, glass balls or, or bottles, or they, they repair, repair uh, chandeliers. So uh, since 2012, they produced the bell table in now five colors. And here you see the guy who's doing the, the mold for the glass blowing for the, for the, for the feet. And it's, I, when I started the project, I sent them 3D files, but at the end they don't need, they just need the 2D silhouette for the table. And then they cut the, the, the mold out of this wooden piece. And here you see the mold. This was for the first samples, 2012 in January. And here on the left, there are two guys. They blow the pieces. And they always work in a team. And then they need experience from minimum eight years to blow a piece like this that's precise in colors. Because they have to guarantee a special wall thickness for the stability. So there's a wooden mold. They can blow like 150, 200 pieces. And then they produce a new mold. And here on the left, they they build up this glass bubble, which takes like 15 minutes to do this, this bubble. They always have to go to the oven, dip it inside to build it up step by step, and they have to guarantee the specific temperature the whole time. And uh, finally, they have a bubble, which is really flexible. It's like a chewing gum at the, at, the, at the end of this pipe, which is like one and a half centimeter thick and two meters long. And they always yeah, work together and change the pipe and turning and build it up. And my question always was, uh, why is the glass after the cooling process, after the whole process, still transparent by using wooden molds which are completely black burned inside? And the reason is they put the, the wooden molds and all the wooden tools they use in a water bucket the whole night. And it's completely wa uh, wet. So when they blow the the hot glass um, bubble inside, it gets a steam between the glass and the wood, so it's like a protection layer. And now they, they put the bubble inside, they close the mold, and now he's blowing and turning it the, the whole time for yeah, half a minute. And then they open it and they have the final piece. You will see later a movie about with the production of Oda I did recently. So this is the final piece for the coffee table. And now it goes to the oven. It's like an assembly line, and it cools down for three hours. And then you see the, the final product. So it's this color now. This was in January. It was completely uh, yeah, snowy outside, so it's a quite nice picture. And now they, they have to cut the crown, the top of the, of the base you see here. So they just cut a line and then with fire it, it breaks away. And this guy is, is sanding the, the sharp edges. And on the other side, this is, uh, there I did the prototypes, it's close to Frankfurt, a company who's doing lampshades and stuff like this. They did the, the top part, so this is brass. In this case, it cut the circle, and this is the mold for this piece. And by metal spinning, by turning, they press the metal blade directly on this, on this mold, on the tooling. So you see the process here to get this shape. So it's a lot of handwork, it's a lot of steps in very traditional ways. And in the case of copper, they have to heat it again to, to get the, ten uh, the tensions in the material in control. And these are two versions here at Classicon, at the product development. And also the newest version we just launched uh, the last days at Cologne Fair. And Avenue Road is the first dealer, actually, who carries it. And these are the first product images of the table. 
Yeah, and we, this is also the lamp I, I presented at that time at Salone Satellite, so it's also in production now with Classicon. And here, here again, the new colors. So in the two sides, like coffee table and side table. These baskets uh, were actually the starting point with the collaboration with Moroso, Italian brand. Um, I met Patrizio Moroso when I was exhibiting the third time at Salone Satellite in Milan, so it was quite successful for, that for me. The first time was the bell table and last time the connection to, to Moroso. And Patrizia Moroso asked me to do a, to do a product for, for them. And while thinking about a concept, because I really need a concept or a material-driven idea at the beginning. And I wanted to do a very light um, armchair sofa. And while thinking about structures and a specific idea, how, yeah, because it's very important to tell a story. And I came up with uh, this, this children's socks here on the left with this anti-slippery print at the bottom side. And I was thinking about to have this print also on the bottom side of, this, of the armchair and sofa. So we started at a screen printing company close to my studio some tests. And this test together with the socks and a very rough model, this model I presented to Patrizia Moroso when we met. So the story was to have something functional but also decorative at the base and a very soft upholstery on the top. And this was the starting point for this project and the closer collaboration. So we went back to the studio, developed the details, and then it was a kind of ping pong which is very important with the company and the development team at Moroso to, to finalize the product. So this is at the prototyping at, at Moroso. At the back you can see Uncle Marino. He's the uncle of Patrizia Moroso. He's working there since he's 15 and now he's 75 around this. So he has a big, big knowledge and experience to do prototypes and he worked with all the art designers like Ron Arad and Konstantin Gritschic before to develop the products for, for Moroso. So here are some pictures of the, of the process, how we communicated and selected the right fabrics. And this was actually a few days before Milan Fair. We discussed the final uh, yeah, products for the fair here on the left. It's Patricio Moroso you have seen maybe here last year. And um, the final ones for the, for the setting. And the year after, we presented also the sofa. The latest product I did for Moroso was the Bancholi chair we presented last year, uh, which is produced in Dakar, in Senegal. So the husband of Patrizio Moroso is from Senegal, and so they have a, a good relationship to this country, a connection to the country. And all the products are produced 100% there to support craftsmen there in the city. And uh, she asked me two years ago to do a new product for my free collection, Moroso Africa collection. Uh, there also Patrizia Occhiola and Todd Bonche did something. And so I, I did something now. And I, because she asked me, I'm very interested in this materials and crafts. So we designed a collection of uh, armchairs uh, and tables inspired by by the ostrich birds, by its mating dance, by the wings. And uh, Bancholi is the name of ostrich in the area of Dakar, so it's in the Wolof language. And uh, we sent the files in 2D to Dakar and they bend it there with real manpower and do the weaving. So we selected a lot of colors for this project and they do it completely by hand. So each chair is really a s single piece because each weaver has its special um, technique. And this makes it very interesting. And this is the beauty of design for, for Moroso, that the, that the chair are, uh, or the products in general are colorful, happy. They have their specific attitudes. And if there's something different to the other one, it's not a mistake. Or as, uh, imperfection. It's more something that it's something handcrafted. It says something about the beauty. 
And it's the same with the bell table you have seen. There could be a small air bubble in the glass, but this is also a sign for, for craftsmanship. So these are the, the chairs in my garden and the whole collection. This is a typical yeah, German house, a framework house. And this was the starting point for a product, the Wooster chair, which is also at Avenue Road. You can see over there at the, the booth. Um, the starting point was this wooden construction for the architecture. And this was an early sketch that I wanted to use these connections, very uh, simple, uh, to get a structure for the seat and the back. The back also has a, a separate weaving with ropes or leather. And I really like to mix colors and materials. So this was a first 3D sketch, so I always do very rough sketches. Here the shape is different to the final one, actually. But I really like to do this very rough and, and simple to visualize my, my idea. And then we designed the, the whole collection. This was one of the first mock-ups in wood. This was a sample before it was another idea to take a natural fiber, which was horrible. And this was like three weeks of before the fair. So you, you are there in, in Italy and have to decide then in a few hours in which direction you want to go. And then we found a nice rope, which is used for, for sailing, actually, which is the final one. So sometimes you have an idea and then it looks horrible and you have to decide during the meeting which direction you want to go. So this is the a leather version and this is with, with the rope actually for a project in Australia. Yeah, and the final one from the, from the fair. So that you can mix and mix a lot of mat with materials and, and colors. This is in my, in my flat, the two containers. Um, this is a very old technique called mercury glass. In German, it's called Bauernsilber, which means silver for, or stainless steel for farmers, so for, for poor people. At that time, when they invented this material, stainless steel was very expensive, or silver blades, and it was not affordable for everyone. So a glass company from Czech invented this technique. It's a double walled glass, and they fill in a liquid silver ring, and then they shake it, let it dry, and then it, be, it looks more or less like um, yeah, stainless steel. So I started a, a, a project with them. So here you, you see it again. Yeah, and these are the final ones. So I, I really like to look for traditional techniques which are very raw, or, and yes, and I like to, to use them to transfer them in a new design. And these are new colors we presented also in Cologne recently. Another inspiration for a product, for a shelf, are these uh, bridges, you know, from Venice. When there's a high tide every year, the whole city is with these bridges to come from one place to the other place. And I found this very, you know, this architectural glass profile. So it's very simple design and it's a, it's a, a shelving system. So from the inspiration of these bridges. This is one of the first projects I did for Rosenthal in Germany. It's a traditional uh, porcelain company. And they asked me to do a project to mix colors because now more and more companies ask me to, to do something with colors and materials. And the inspiration were this very cheap uh, yeah, flowers from petrol station with the very cheap plastic wrapping we have in Germany. I don't know if you have them like this as well. But they are a nightmare with this cheap <laughs> wrappings. And uh, yeah, I have been recently in Tokyo and you can't see something like this in Japan. So this is really just a fast, cheap wrapping and yeah, for Valentine's Day or something. Yeah, you have to be lucky with this flowers. But this uh, is the inspiration uh, to have something like a, like a color around the flowers. So this was the, is the final product at the end. So we transferred the idea to a more elegant, sophisticated product with the glass color.
Another inspiration uh, was this aluminium foil, the golden one, which the German knows very well because there's a beer bottle in the Black Forest and at the top on the neck there's always this material around and when you start drinking it you move it away and you put it in your pocket and next day I cleaned my pockets and there was this paper and this was actually the, the starting point for this idea with the plissé to have this on top of the flowers, uh, of the waist. And here you have an insight uh, for Rosenthal, for the company, how they produce this Falda vase, which is very complicated and it's just possible for a manufacturer who do it by hand to do this piece. It's not possible in, in mass production because it's too complicated with all these details in this yeah, plissé. So this mold actually has nine elements. So here you see quite a lot of them. Now this woman, because you have seen it's, it should be gold in, inside, so this uh, woman has to put a liquid wax on top of the porcelain. So when the other guy you see later is um, putting the, the lacquer inside the, the waist, it doesn't stick to this place because I wanted to have it biscuit without the shiny lacquer outside, just inside. So she is painting the wax on top and this will burn later in the burning process for the coloring. Which looks quite interesting. And the color is just to see where she has painted already. Then they do the stamp with the signature. And this guy is, has in this um, carafe the, the lacquer and filled it on the base and also inside. So, and this is how it looks after all this process. And it takes really a long time to do this. And inspiration was this aluminium foil from this yeah, beer bottle. And then I asked Rosenthal to do something with colors and we did the first collection with colored porcelain for them. They just have white and black and I asked them, we have to reinvent your products, we need colors and we went to a material lab and develop colors. For ceramic is quite often, but for porcelain it's more difficult because it needs another temperature for the burning process. And we, we started to think about clocks and waists and hooks. So these are the first pictures we did. We just presented since today in, in Paris at Mazorbje. So these are the, the products. And this for the for the wall hooks you see here. So these are the first pictures they just sent me and I wanted to share it with you. This is a project I, I presented with Caesar Stone uh, in Milan. Last year it was uh, invited by Wallpaper Magazine uh, to, to collaborate with, uh, with Caesar Stone. The idea was to, to do furniture in a knockdown process. So the inspiration came also from Ferdinand Kramer. He's a German architect. He built a lot of the university and furniture in, in Frankfurt. And he did actually this knockdown furniture, as you know now, from IKEA a lot. And he did it in the 40s. And this is uh, the product we did. So it was the idea, knockdown furniture, to use the single sheets of Caesar stone material and to assemble it together to, to kind of bench. It's a conceptual work. These projects are, are tables for La Chance, a French brand. Uh, the idea was to have a copper or metal tray and this is sticking in different ways to a marble column. So just some pictures to this project. And this was a project I last year one week after Milan Fair, I was invited to go to Zimbabwe to the middle of, of Africa. And invited by uh, the British Council to do a project with traditional basket weavers there. So I flew to Zimbabwe, then it took me 24 hours by car to go to Binga in the north, to Zambia, close to the Wick Falls, Victoria Falls. And this was one of my most interesting appearance because I was there working with 20 women 
in a village without water, tap water and electricity. And before, one week before, I was in Milan with all this luxury furniture. So it was a big difference. And uh, they, in this area of Binga, there are 1,200 women w working for this craft center doing baskets. And for a family, it's the only way actually to earn money. The father is doing, or the husband is always doing the fields and protect them from the elephants and other um, animals. And the, the wife is taking care from the, for the kids, for cooking and doing the baskets. So they work on a basket like this four days from sunrise to sunset. I thought it goes faster, but it takes amazing time, a long time, and really work from the first sun ray to, to uh, tonight. And then, they go for, then they go to bed because they have no electricity. So we designed some very simple objects they can do there because it, it's very important for these designs that they can get the material there for free. And uh, my assistant, we arrived there. These are the women there in the age from 16, 17 to 75. And this is the mother with the red with, of Arti, the small guy, and he was always around jumping on the mother, because he has no toy, he was always jumping on the mother and she was weaving. Incredible. And yeah, like this, it takes one day, eight hours to do this. And before this, they have to cut the grass and to clean it and to get it in parallel lines and yeah. And it was at the, in the morning and the afternoon, we were singing and dancing together. It was so much fun and um, yeah, happiness there, it was incredible. So my idea was actually, because they just do white baskets, uh, my idea was to, in, to, to use also some colors, but it was difficult for me to find colors there and, or to buy some because there was no do it yourself store or something. And the big stores are 450 kilometers away and if they have to go there, they need the whole money of one month to go there by bus, and they have like $16 a month, a family. And uh, so I found these rice bags. Every one of them, they have the rice bags made of plastic fibers, and we use these fibers to, to weave together with the natural materials. So here, you see the rice bag, and they, they destroy it, use the fibers, and connect it with the natural fiber. And then in this area, it's very popular clay, pottery and I was asking for a woman who's able to do it and they told me yeah there's one old woman about 70 in the countryside we can pick her up and we went there by car completely in the bushes and we asked her and 10 minutes later she came with us so she was very spontaneous with her 70 years and came with us and did the and these two women did the, did the pottery very traditional and then they burned it here so they they did a uh, yeah, like a hill with all the, all the wood and they did it in a very traditional way and then it was burned and then they combined both techniques you see here and now I, we will present this project in Frankfurt next year on, uh, next, next month on the fair because for me it was very important to show the products there to get new markets for them because they just sell in Zimbabwe and South, South Africa so this is an opportunity and was a quite um, tough yeah, discussion with the European Union to get the money for one person to come for the flight. But finally I got it, because the aim of this project was to have an exhibition in the capital of Zimbabwe, but it's not that big support for them, so now we show it on the fair and I hope it will be successful. And this was at the last day, the dance. This is a lamp we just presented also at, on the fair these days, the color lamp, which started with two shapes I put together, I was playing with these two small bowls. And we designed this for um, Danish brand Gooby, so it has also a glass element with an aluminum shade on top. And the special idea was I used the first time is that the glass is painted, painted and then burned again, so the color sticks well to the glass. And um, yeah, you see it's, a, it's one glass piece and the top is also colored and we did this range of, of lightings in two sizes. 
This is the inspiration for Oderlamp you see at Avenue Road. These are pictures by Hiller and Bernd Becher, a famous photographer couple from Düsseldorf in Germany. And they did these pictures in North America of uh, water towers. And I was really inspired by the proportion to have this big, massive reservoir tank on top and then this very small, small legs. And we started with very rough models to have a reservoir of light on top and a simple metal structure. And we designed three sizes. And the size uh, depends from my, my phone call to a glass blower. I ask him what's the biggest size you can blow. And actually the ones of the older lamp of the medium and the high size is the biggest size you can see here. It's like 50 centimeters. And this depends actually from the hole in the oven where they always have to take, off, take out the, the glass. And you will see now a movie I just did in December at this company, how they do it. So here you see the bubble and here the, uh, the, the color will be an amber color. So they separate the, the color element they use later in the mold and the other piece is just, they throw away, it's just for stability. So they always have to go to this gas flame to keep the temperature. If the temperature, temperature will, uh, will go down, it will not break the next day. It could break two years later. So they have the experience that it stays stable. The crack could be really weeks later or years later. They have to guarantee that the temperature is more or less the same in the process. And here you see the big mold. And he's still turning, blowing, and he really knows how to do it. I, I try to do it with a small piece, and it's quite, the, with a small piece, it's quite easy, but he, they say slower uh, or faster. They know how, really how to do it, that the wall thickness is the same. Yeah. I thought the same, now I go to the left and now he's moving with me. Yeah, it's with the, with the phone. <laughs> but there's a reason he has to open together with his colleague the, the shape, the, f the tooling. So now you see the final one and now they add two glass elements to, to take later a kind of fork to get the glass bottle away. Yeah, it's a, a technical element they need. And now they, they have to heat the, the glass element again to keep the, the right temperature before putting it in the oven to cool down. And it's really beautiful to be in this place. And they asked me what I mentioned to do one. And for me, the most difficult time was to take the pipe and to take out the liquid glass from the oven because it was so hot. And I, I have this ring here from my grandfather, and this was nearly burning. It's so hot, I was away one meter, but it was too much. So the blowing for me of a small piece was easier than just to take the glass out. So they are. I don't know how they can survive there, but okay. So this is the final medium one, and we did this three sizes. And it's very, uh, I think, a very classic lamp. W and you see the inspiration of the water tower you have seen before by Bert and Hiller Peche. And this is actually. Um, a preview for a product I developed together with Avenue Road. It was the first initial sketch of a family of um, yeah, side coffee tables. Thank you very much. The biggest thing is actually uh, to transfer this inspiration to a design. And this mainly is happens in my, in my head. And then it, sometimes with the order lamp, it was n like half a year, the idea of the water tower to transfer to a light. And then I develop it like 90% in my, my head. And then we start, I, I, 
talk with my team, and then we de develop the final one. And with the, with the bell table, I think I forgot to mention there, the starting point was on one side the material, and on the other side it was the idea or the, yeah, that normal side tables have a metal structure and a glass plate on top, and I wanted to put this upside down. So the idea was to have a volume made of glass, which is transparent, and to have a more heavy looking element, the brass or the copper, uh, on top. So it's always the story also at the beginning to tell, which is important. Um, do you, would you say that the manufacturing process informs your design at all moving forward? Yeah, for me it's very important to work with this craftsman together so I get my knowledge or my, yeah, my biggest support from them. So when I start a project with the company, I always want to visit them to see the possibilities, their heritage, the products they did to meet the people also. And because you need a very good relationship, especially to the craftsman. And for me, it's, very, it's my kind of, yeah, my approach that I want to use these very honest, real materials because I want to do designs which are like compagnons for your life. I don't want to do trendy things. I want to design things which get older in a positive way, which get the patina like with the bell table also if you have a copper one. And this is very important for me. Because if you have, a, for example, a plastic chair, it gets scratches and it doesn't look that nice like an old wooden chair, which has a more positive connotation or idea. How is 3D printing influencing your designs? Do you see that um, working with that in the future? Actually, in the, in the, we use it for prototypes. And also in the case of Rosenthal, the porcelain company, they do the 3D printing. And always um, like 25% bigger than the final mold because porcelain shrinks. And they use the rapid prototyping element to do the mold. They use this as a positive form, then they do the clay negative around this 3D printed element, and then they do the final ones. So it's, it's very important. So I really use all techniques, but I'm very into to use this uh, traditional crafts, which are getting more and more lost, and for me it's very important as a kind of social sustainability, because in some countries, I know in Europe, like in UK, you don't have that many craftsmen anymore. And I really like to, to, to use these techniques for my approach. And at the, when I did the, the bell table in brass, there was not that many brass items on the market. Now it's, there are a lot. And I did it like 2008, the table. Um, what do you say there, there's, there was a difference from when you started out and you exhibited in Milan? You were invited to exhibit there, you, you mentioned, or was it with a university exhibit or something? In Milan, it's a Luna Satellite. It's a platform for young designers. Yeah. There are always like 160 stands. Yeah. And uh, you have to send a kind of portfolio, uh, your idea to Marva, and she selects the ones. What do you say in the beginning was more after you exhibited um, companies approaching you and asking you, you to design a certain product for them and now at the stage you're at now it's more like you approaching the companies? So at that time I idea? was knocking at the doors at that time when I was exhibiting there and but I, I was one of the lucky ones that uh, Classicon saw the bell table there and at the end I got the contact to Moroso there as well. And at the beginning, it was, it was very, very difficult. And I was always trying to, for young designers, it's important to, to be present and to use platforms like also like here to get in contact to the press, to companies. Uh, but it's very hard at the beginning. Nowadays, for me, it's, of course, easier. And yeah, but at that time, for me, I, I participated at like three, four shows every year to be in the mind of the people, because sometimes they just observe you and look what they're doing, in which direction you develop your design language. Yeah. Great, thank you everybody, and thank you especially to Sebastian. Thank and you. Enjoy the rest of your week here. Thank you.